Hello, I'm Peter Switzer. Welcome to the program which puts you in touch with the best and brightest minds in the business. On the show tonight, the man who could change our financial system forever, David Murray, the chair of the Abbott government's financial inquiry, will give us a sneak preview of what are the big issues on what it might do to our passion for investing in banks. Morgan's chief economist Michael Knox will tell us what today's China economic data means for his view on the Chinese economy for the rest of the year. The former boss of Comsec and Hall of Fame stockbroker Paul Ricard will tell us how he's investing in this very testy market and we'll find out what technical analysts actually do and we will see if we can trust this bull market with technical expert Michael Gable and we'll see how an Italian family restaurant is thinking and cooking outside the square in this challenging but improving economy. Stay with us for the next hour and we'll bring you all the latest corporate news and market analysis, plus learn some valuable lessons from Australian success stories. If you have any questions for me or our guests, email them to switzer at switzer.com.au and you can follow me on Twitter and the handle is at Peter Switzer. But first, the Abbott government has instituted a financial inquiry that could change the way that banks do business and it could have wide ranging effects on regulation and ultimately on the profitability of financial institutions and we are strange we do invest a lot of money in financial institutions so I'm very interested in what the chair of the inquiry David Murray has to say about what might lie ahead David thanks for joining us thanks Peter. now this is a financial inquiries they have very big impacts so there was the Wallace inquiry the Campbell inquiry you're going to get a history mate with this one well there's going to be a lot of submissions they close this uh, coming week yeah uh, the, the deadline and you know we could get hundreds yeah. um, so we've done a lot our committee's actually had six meetings already we started in January we're preparing for an interim report mid-year uh, we've been encouraging people to talk mm -hmm. about what's on their mind encouraging submissions and we hope that'll add to the process okay so all aspects of the financial system are up for consideration from, yeah very from wide so very banks, wide super, wealth management, all those things. That's right. Yeah. Insurance, banking, superannuation, which takes in wealth management. Yeah. OK, right. Now, in a nutshell, tell us what it is you hope to achieve in the, the big picture, the big dividend out of this inquiry. Well, unlike the Campbell Committee or the Wallace Committee, we've been given such a wide terms of reference that starts from what's needed in the Australian economy. Mm -hmm. So we will look at uh, whether or not the financial system encourages decision making in the broader economy that makes the Australian economy productive and as fast growing as we can, particularly since we live next to Asia. Okay, so if you guys, um, in looking at the, the financial system through all these submissions from really informed people who are at the coalface, if you identify obstacles that you think are holding back the economy, yep. you're going to try and change them, I presume, provided they don't undermine the, the stability and integrity of the financial system. Precisely. So we, we will look at those obstacles and decide or try and figure out whether the, the, there is a distortion in the way people invest because of tax, because of regulation, because of competition. Uh, and we'll try and see whether that's changeable or not mm. and if so make recommendations. Now you come from a, a fairly advantaged position I guess that's why you were asked to, to chair it. You, you ran Commonwealth Bank um, and clearly a significant financial institution. When you were boss of CBA were there times you said gee I wish I could change that if, if so we'd do better and the economy would do better? Uh, well, of course, um, but you have to weigh up the self-interest of the bank itself versus the interest of the economy. And, a saintly uh, character like you, David, you well, would always thought about the economy simultaneously, wouldn't you? Well, Peter, I'm glad you made that point because you can, in business in Australia, get so carried away with your self-interest that you promote solutions to things that tend to reduce the size of the pie for everybody, even though it might be in your own interest. And I think. In business you have to be very careful about that mm. but for the financial system there were issues I was always very skeptical about why a government or a prudential regulator would ever change the four pillars policy mm. um, and and other issues particularly the extent to which the when I was there uh, we were 
at the margin funding from outside Australia, whatever that would, would that ever create a consequence? Mm. And the Wallace Committee itself did not anticipate that a problem in our financial system would come from an external source. They thought more like that subprime it would... undermining the yeah. securitisation, which globally, was yeah, and and they thought that a problem would come from an individual institution. Mm. So there's a lot of things that have changed that we've got to take into account. So now, obviously, you brought up four pillars. I was going to bring it up anyway. Is it possible if this if this inquiry says the four pillars policy, uh, which means basically? A local big bank can't take over another local big bank. Could that change? I can't envisage how uh, you could change the four pillars policy, allow a merger of major banks, uh, hold out that you're interested in competition, but also not create a bigger too big to fail problem for the regulator. So I think it's a very tough ask. Okay. Too big to fail. That operates here. We, we know we, we linked it to, in, in America, uh, and Lehman Brothers was, was the classic case you know, that was around. But are our four big, four big banks too big to fail? Uh, well, I think um, most significant participants in the financial system are too big to fail because of the interconnectedness of all of the players in the system, mm. in the banking system. So. We have to figure out whether it's a failure of one institution that would cause a problem or it's a more general uh, issue for the industry that would cause a problem to government and then how would that get sorted out. Okay. What about the, the idea that... Um... Because, I mean, I should add that what, you have to have confidence in the system. Mm -hmm. So you have to build it so that people retain confidence. Well, that's a brilliant link to my next question which is a brilliant question as well, David. Um, there's a presumption out there that we did well in Australia, our economy did well, because our banks were better than the failed banks overseas. And a part of the reason why they did well was APRA did a champion job. Now, you used to run a bank, <laughs> and do you think APRA was overrated in their role uh, in making sure Aussie banks were one of the, some of the best in the world? Not necessarily. Uh, there was a conjunction of events. The government at the time, the going in position was no net debt, uh, sorry, no debt uh, and a triple A rating. Yeah. The banks had been well managed compared with most around the world and that had been a, 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 one, a decade of hard work. Mm. APRA had invented a new form of supervision. Supervision as distinct from regulation. That is what they do about monitoring what mm. people are doing. Yep. How do they assess the riskiness or otherwise of individual institutions? Mm. Uh, they've done more on that front than I think most around the world and that's turning out to be a very significant issue going forward. Okay, but was is it possible this inquiry could actually say even though APRA did a good job they are a little bit excessive and are, cr are cramping the potential of the banks. Is that a possibility? I'm not saying you're supporting it, but is that a possible recommendation? Well, I think we're going to hear uh, from the official sector yes. that a lot needed to be done after the crisis. Yep. On the grounds you can't let these sort of things happen again. Mm. We're going to hear an awful lot from the industry how the regulation has become too intense. Yep. And we'll have to go back to first principles and decide how you, how you balance that all out. But we're interested in whether the Australian financial system is there for the Australian economy and users of that system. Yes, so it's going to be a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? Like, yeah. And it's fair enough. If, if there's excessive regulation, and even though it's helped us, you would say, or a lot of people would say, maybe we can peel it back and get more efficiency into the banking system, more profitability. And, and you know, my view is they do invest in banks. So if this inquiry makes it easier for banks to be more productive and more profitable, it could be for, good for our bottom lines as well, David. Well, look, Peter, we want stability in the system, so APRA's role is fundamental. Yeah. But in, in, the, in the privately owned banking system that we've emerged with, What's really important is that investors in banks want to stay in. Mm -hmm. So if, if things get a bit touchy, they have reason to believe that they can stay in and, if necessary, put more capital into a bank. Yeah. That's, that's also very helpful to APRA in the way they 
manage the system. Will the the old issue of the government standing behind the deposits in banks, do you think that would be an issue that will be looked at by the inquiry? After the crisis it must be. Yeah. Um, so confidence in the system is ultimately the issue. Mm. And then you have to figure out if things go wrong, how would they be managed at the time? Mm. Uh, because we, we, we certainly don't want the Australian taxpayer losing any money. Do you think we need to back our banks? Our taxpayers have to back our banks? Uh, that's a tough question. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's the issue, that issue combined with competition, efficiency and how the financial system allocates capital in the economy at large so that the economy is really you know, running like a Swiss clock. That's what we want to That's do. That's the goal, Swiss clock. Yeah. Uh, uh, the era of superannuation. Um, if you read the newspapers on, on the weekend, there's always someone there bashing up poor old self-managed super funds. Uh, are, are there a lot of people trying to get you to, to see it from their point of view? I, look, I, I, would, I would imagine if I was representing, say, for example, self-managed super funds, I'd like you to see it from my point of view, but so the flip side is industry funds would like you to see it from there. Is that kind of thing going on at this point in time? Of course it is. And let me just say first that we, we have been already engaging with big institutions, small institutions, the community-owned banks, um, the, the industry associations from uh, all sides of superannuation, uh, the regulators themselves. We've had quite intensive meetings and discussions already. Mm -hmm. and, and of course in the superannuation industry, there are those who believe that people in self-managed funds don't know what they're doing and so that should be changed. Uh, there are those who believe that it, it's their money, they should be able to decide, mm -hmm. and that's healthy. Uh, the way you, what belief you hold about that changes the way you regulate things. But uh, the self-managed funds are very large in the system. Yeah. Uh, the average size of them is not far above what's viable given the cost of running them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's the average, be careful with averages. Yeah. Uh, so they're a very important sector and we will have to decide um, uh, w whether they should be regulated the same way or a different way. Uh, that has significant implications because if they're self-managed, it's on the individual to decide what to do, then it's very difficult for the individual if something goes wrong to say, I need the benefit of some sort of support. Mm. So are you sort of suggesting that if there's a, an opinion that self-managed super funds on average, even though I've got to be careful about the word average, uh, are vulnerable and might need some regulation. The, the payoff might be if the fund uh, trustees commit to, to being regulated, there then might be some protection if something goes wrong. Uh, well, there's not much protect, protection in the superannuation industry generally, mm. but to the extent there's any, uh, then that's possible, but um, the whole point of a self-managed fund is I want to do it myself. Yeah. The interesting thing is that a hell of a lot of the people on that particular inquiry would actually have self-managed super funds themselves, so they, they wouldn't want the industry funds actually you know, ruining it for them, would they? But it was self-interest won't come into it. Well, some of my friends, Peter, say to me, don't kick an own goal. <laughs> but as you know, at the top of the program you pointed out, um, it's more than self-interest in this. Yeah, without, yeah. And, and I, I think that's the important point. I think there are a lot of people who have a shot at self-managed super funds. Uh, and it would be interesting to see how, how you guys objectively test the way they're going. That's going to be ultimately your goal. Sure. Well, we, we, we don't have a defined benefit system where the trustees decide everything. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a defined contribution system in which people can decide uh, what asset allocation to put, what to, sort of fund to put that money or whether to manage it themselves. Mm. So any change from that is very significant. Well, you've, you know wealth management very well. You know, you, you, I presume Colonial First State was created under your watch. Was that true? We was acquired it at my time, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So and it's, it's become a, an enormous uh, wealth manager. Um, FOFA, we heard today that uh, the Finance Minister, Mat Matthias Cormann, has actually stopped the reversal of Labor's um, changes to the, to the financial advice sector. Uh, is this going to be an issue that is going to be looked at by the financial inquiry? Well, I think uh, I'll have to see uh, what the Minister has decided in, in detail. Mm. 
uh, if what you say is true, then uh, the minister has got the inquiry uh, there to have a look at it along with everything else. Mm. That's no bad thing. Uh, what we would do is look uh, what other countries have done, uh, how they've handled this issue of advice. Mm. Um, but it's very important because you want affordable quality advice mm. available to people. As, as you know, um, with the amazing work that you do, um, financial advice is not easy stuff. No, it's definitely not. And my greatest concern is that I think only 20% of Australians get financial advice. And part of the problem is I think the industry hasn't done enough to make it attractive. Yeah. Okay, good. What about um, the, uh, the impl implications of changes that you put forward but are politically unpopular. Are you expecting, because like Ken Henry did a fantastic tax review and a government said, well, great, but we can't do it. it you're going to be a bit of a political football, David. You know that eventually when the whole thing is finished. Peter, I think the stakes are high here. Um, on, at one level, you can say our, our financial system was never broken. You, you could say that about some others, but yeah. our financial system wasn't broken. On the other hand, you can say, well, this country, after so many years of boom and, and, and um, uh, mining-related terms of trade boom, has not produced a lot from it. And at the same time, we, we have a structural budget deficit, a level of government debt which is too high for the character of our economy, and somebody is going to have to produce some reforms that radically improve productivity and up our rate of growth to get through that problem. Mm. Now, you can't do that for a market economy and, and to, to institute those reforms and then say we're going to have some sort of um, con a centrally controlled, inefficient financial system. You know, it's like the gearbox. We're going to have a great vehicle but a not a very good gearbox. Mm. So from that perspective, this inquiry is very, very important. Anything we can do to facilitate productivity and growth, we've got to, we've got to find and put the recommendations down. Yeah. And the government can pick them up. They can, they can ask the electorate if they're interested in them first, mm -hmm. or they can implement them if they like them. Something like venture capital, that's a, a classic example of where people complain it's very hard getting that kind of money, and the venture capital uh, industry is always criticised. Would you hope? You know, post the, the Murray inquiry, as it, as it will become called by yeah. journalists, uh, that areas like that become comparable with over, uh, overseas venture capital markets? That would be great, particularly the US market. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are so many different uh, areas of specialisation, so much capital wanting to come into that all the time. Uh, if you're going to have an innovative economy, an inventive economy, you need a great venture capital market. Mm. And it appears less exciting than it could be in Australia. So we're looking for submissions on, on improvements we can make there. Yeah. You know, we talk about for, a, for an, a sophisticated economy like Australia with this huge superannuation uh, asset level, 1.6 trillion, mm. Why there's not more interest in a corporate bond market? Well, I was going to ask you that, and I've always blamed people like you because, you know, the CEOs of big banks they don't want, you know, bonds to be sold over the counter and bypass you guys because you guys, you know, when, when you were running Commonwealth Bank, you were a very important source of of, of funds. But was that? A... I'm not so convinced about that yeah. because, um, from the bank point of view of the banks. Um, sometimes they need, they need a safety valve themselves. Mm. They don't want to be so committed to foreign markets when there's high credit growth in Australia. Mm. They don't want to be over committed to individual large exposures to corporations which in Australia because of our shape have an oligopolistic structure. Mm. Sorry about the language. But it's all right. I'm a commerce. I love that kind of talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so sometimes they can get caught. On the other hand, if they want to build, build a business in bringing people to market, mm. That's very healthy for them, mm. but there has to be a reason why, on the other side, the insurance companies or the superannuation funds or individual holders of securities uh, need to get interested in bonds as an alternative to equities and other assets. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, banks would love to sell hybrid securities just over a counter rather than going through the rigmarole that 
they currently have to do to sell hybrid secu securities. Yeah. So there are a couple of examples. There's the infrastructure market, the way we fund agriculture. You can chop it any way you like, mm. but we want to have a look at all of them and see what impediments are there. Okay, so submissions end when? Uh, 31st of March next okay. week. Okay, and how long have you got to come up with the, the great recommendations? Uh, we've got till the middle of the year to produce an interim report that says what's changed since Wallace, what does this system look like, yep. what are the issues raised in submissions, yep. and then we'll talk about ways you might approach those mm -hmm. without making firm recommendations. Mm -hmm. Then we have another round of submissions so you can get a second crack at it. Yep. And right. then after that in November we'll produce a final report and I can sign off. So, so by the end of this year we'll know what you guys are recommending. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Can't wait, mate. November. I can read it over Christmas. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, Peter. And good luck with it. OK, coming up after the break, um, the market appeared to shrug off the bad data from China today. So is it a sign that confidence is coming back to the local economy? And is there still value to be had? Stockbroking legend Paul Rickard joins me next. <laughs>